Welcome to the first ecosystem session of DockerCon. Um, I'm pleased to welcome uh, Gianluca Borello here, who's going to talk about PACT, Runtime Security for Containers. Uh, Sysdig is a longtime partner with Docker. Um, I'm Dan Powers and uh, work on technology integrations at Docker. Um, and uh, Sysdig is a uh, you know, leader in Docker, uh, Docker monitoring, Kubernetes monitoring, um, as well as uh, container troubleshooting and security. So everyone, uh, please welcome John Luca to this session. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to Runtime Security for Containers. My name is John Luca. Uh, I work at Sysdig in the engineering team. And today I want to talk to you a little bit about what we have been up to at Sysdig in the open source world uh, when it comes to container security. So the agenda, I will start with some very brief observations on uh, container security that we um, essentially had during this journey. And this will be very short because uh, I like to show stuff rather than tell stuff. So then the, in the second part, we will analyze how you can actually build a runtime container security from scratch. So what are the pieces that you need uh, uh, you know, to use when you want to roll out your own? And this is going to be useful because, again, if you're going to do something like that, for example, roll out your own, you uh, are going to be following these steps. And the whole, uh, the whole demo it will be full, essentially, of very practical example and use cases. So you should be able to get a lot of value out of it. So let's start with the uh, very first part, random observations on container security. Uh, at Sysdig, we have been uh, at the forefront of container monitoring and troubleshooting for quite a few years now. And uh, a little bit more recently, we started saying, well, we have some pretty good basic building blocks you know, to have a lot of observability from this container. So can we leverage these building blocks for uh, some security use cases and so bring additional value to the container ecosystem that is evolving so rapidly. And so we started saying, okay, what is so interesting about uh, containers and security? Because it's obvious, like you can read it everywhere that containers clearly offer, uh, are essentially a very good playground to implement uh, better security and better security for your applications. And why is that? So up here we can see that uh, Fundamentally, at runtime, a container is just a Linux process, right, that is wrapped in uh, Linux groups and Linux namespaces for lightweight virtualization. And what is nice about this is that it's really just a process. So the attack surface of your whole container is really just the attack surface of a process. So it's very well scoped as compared to, for example, a virtual machine that is running several services. And so whenever your, uh, essentially, your attack surface is uh, limited, you can also do better security. And this is at runtime. At the same time, way before the runtime, at build time, containers are these very great uh, immutable artifacts, right? With the container image, you have an immutable artifact that represents the file system of your container, and this can be digitally signed, encrypted, all that. So even before the container actually runs, you can uh, already do better security for containers, because you can do all sorts of static analysis and you know, analyze your uh, uh, image for uh, obsolete packages or something like that. And at the same time, also completely related to this, because the attack surface is uh, uh, so limited and containers serve such a predictable workload inside them, we can also uh, venture into a few other applications such as anomaly detection and behavioral monitoring, which is something that, you know, in the open source world uh, happened for quite a long time. For example, with AppArmor, you have, you know, the possibility of profiling your own programs and uh, have uh, automatic security profiles being generated for you. But we think that with containers, this can be essentially brought to the next level and brought to some really, really cool stuff. However, uh, as you can imagine, it's not always, um, it's not always roses. So uh, we also pay a cost when we use containers. And the cost that we identified is, uh, are essentially these four. At the beginning, we have to think about service and orchestration aware. Just because you know how to protect and do better security for a single container, for the most part, it doesn't mean too much because 
you, your container is still just a brick that is uh, essentially serving the implementation of a real service. And the service is what you really want to protect, because the container itself is ephemeral. It will come and go. So, um, you know, for example, if you use a Kubernetes deployment uh, with, with a bunch of pods, you can do, you know, you can do a deployment and your container will get completely restarted on another host with a different IP address. So you need to be aware of your service. And your uh, security solution needs to have services in mind rather than containers. For these exact same reasons, you need uh, uh, a pretty good automated policy management because, again, um, since uh, containers are so ephemeral and they come and go all the time and the infrastructure is so dynamic, the policy engine, so uh, the component of your security system that actually evaluates from, uh, what's good from what's bad, needs to keep up with your cluster orchestrator, and so it needs to adapt, and uh, it needs to be uh, essentially automatically managed. Then, from the point of view of uh, the instrumentation, which is, of course, essential, right, to extract the information that you need to do security and forensics, your instrumentation must not be disruptive. Because if you start requiring your developers to put you know, a little agent inside each of your containers to do security, or maybe uh, install just a plugin that works inside your application, or you require them to write their own you know, security profile, you're going to cause friction, and friction will lead to sloth, and sloth will lead to system failure. So we have seen it in the ecosystem. For example, in Linux, we have uh, SE Linux is absolutely uh, the best security framework, you know, it has the highest level of granularity, super powerful, you can really protect every single individual resource in your system. And yet, since it's a little bit difficult to master for the end user, I've seen a lot of people who just do, you know, set and force zero. It's one of the first things they do on their system. And that is not good. And so you want to avoid that. And the way you avoid that is uh, you reduce friction. And then from the point of view of forensics, and again, forensics is uh, the art you know, of investigating a security incident and seeing all the, all the events that led up to the incident itself, forensics is just as important as, you know, as, as the act of protecting the container. So doing forensics for containers is a little bit more difficult because containers are isolated, so they are one more layer of isolation between you and, your, you know, and the application that you use for observability. And then again, they are very ephemeral. So a container might just be up, you know, a few minutes. And uh, if you want to do forensics, if your container is already gone, you need to store somehow the activity of this container so that you can uh, uh, do proper forensics. And this was my short introduction. Um, what will come next is essentially I want to show you, I want to walk through the uh, you through the experience on of how you can build a runtime container security platform with the example that we took at Sysdig. So how do you start building a runtime container security platform? The first step is by far, you need to be able to deeply observe what's going on in your containers and your services, right? Because observability is the key enabler for everything. Observability enables troubleshooting, enables monitoring, enables security, enables forensics. And uh, there are several ways to observe uh, uh, your, your containers. One strategy that is, for example, the one that we adopted at Sysdig in our open source tools is uh, by looking at things from the system call point of view. The nice thing about the system call point of view is that system calls will be used also by your malicious process, right? Say if you have a, you know, a malicious uh, program, this program at some point will either write some malicious file do some malicious network activity, or run some malicious process. All these, they all figure out you know, at the system call API level. So I think we said, OK, uh, let's write a little kernel instrumentation that gets all the system calls in your system done by whoever containers, uh, even processes outside containers, obviously. And all these system calls, then they get routed to the user space application where we can have rich visibility. And this is, for example, how it works. A really quick one-minute demo. So here I have an infrastructure uh, with a bunch of containers. Uh, it's actually a Kubernetes infrastructure. So if I just run sysdig, 
SysDig is this open source command line tool that uh, works using the system calls. You can see that you get on screen a bunch of system calls. So these are all the system calls that all the processes in your system are doing. But once you export them to your space, you can do some fancy things. For example, you can filter things by container. So say that I'm interested in looking just uh, uh, at the system call that uh, a container image that contains curl is generating. This will show me just the system call that curl inside this curl container is doing. And I can filter even more. So say that I'm not interested you know, in all these memory map system calls. And I can actually look just at the network traffic. right? So I'm going to do end file descriptor type equal IPv4. And this will just show me the network activity that curl is doing, all from the system call point of view. And if I want a nicer visualization, I can pipe these things into just a standard Lua scripting that we support. And for example, I'm going to use this echo file descriptor. And this will tell me all the network activity. You can see here, these are plain HTTP requests. All the network activity that my container is generating. So this is pretty cool. And uh, once you do this, you can also uh, save all these events, all these system calls to a trace file for further inspection and forensics analysis, which is something incredibly cool. So say, for example, that we want to see something a little bit more uh, forensic oriented. So I can run sysdig directly with this script that we call spy users, pretty funny, that uh, essentially intercepts all the exec V system calls that are done in your system, and then it formats them in a nice way, and it shows you all the common lines that the system is doing across every container. So for example, I can uh, also uh, prefix this with dash PC. And this will tell me the individual container name that is doing those things, all by sitting outside the containers. And so this is the first step that I wanted to show you. So with this, we have uh, uh, some uh, pretty good observability at a very deep level. Here you can see a few more examples of filter, of uh, writing things to a trace file, and things like that. But this is essentially, you know, this is the cornerstone of uh, uh, a strong runtime security platform. Because if you're able to observe things deeply, you can use them also for security. The second aspect, which is usually something that is not uh, heavily considered at first, is the ability to understand services. So as I said earlier, just because you're able to observe your container, it doesn't really mean that uh, you can uh, do a lot of stuff with this data that you observe, unless you can correlate the service that this container is implementing. Because again, look at this picture. In this picture, in the left, we have uh, a bunch of services, and uh, uh, a bunch of hosts, and a bunch of containers. Each container is colored to a different code, depending on the service that is actually implementing. And you know, this could be uh, a Swarm task, uh, a Kubernetes deployment, everything like that. And just because you're able to collect all these informations from each container, for example, say all the system calls, you can't really do much unless you pipe all these through a layer that automatically decodes the metadata for each individual event. Because what you want, you want to access a view that is like this. So all the observability metrics that you get from your containers uh, which can then be used for forensic security and like that, they need to be uh, categorized by the proper service. And this service is something that um, uh, a lot of people, they just go by, for example, by container image or container label. But we really work with uh, hundreds of uh, you know, uh, large container adopters. And uh, we really notice that it's not enough to just use container labels or container image. You really need to hook into your, into your cluster manager and extract all sorts of metadata that you might want. For example, you know, uh, Kubernetes labels, the namespace, and things like that. And in some cases, such as in some hybrid environment, your service might also be identified, for example, by um, keys that are completely external to your container environment. For example, AWS tags or AWS region or availability zone. You know, it's pretty typical to have a copy of two services which run exactly the same code, exactly container image, in two different availability zones. And depending on, you know, the kind of traffic that you might route into them, you might want to apply different security policies and stuff like that. So this is very important. And as SysDig, we do this, for example, with this little layer that uh, uh, constantly keeps in touch with the updates from the cluster manager and correlates each and every single system call uh, through the proper metadata. And as we'll see in a second, uh, this uh, will be very essential for doing runtime security. So now we have two pieces. We have a way to observe things very deeply and a way to identify 
the identity of this information that we just observed. The third natural step, since you're talking about security, is to detect bad behavior, right? So we have this huge stream of system calls, and uh, buried in this system call stream, we have the knowledge of what is good and what is bad, right? And so we need a system to detect bad behavior based on that. And our solution has been uh, um, through another open source project that we released a while ago. This is called Sysdic Falco. Sysdic Falco is a behavioral activity monitor with container support. You can think of it as an intrusion detection system that instead of being based uh, you know, network packets, is based on actual system calls. And it's very powerful. So this is how it works. When I run it on my host, for example, over here, Falco is just a container that uh, once you run it, it sets itself up and it demonizes and waits for anomalous activity. So say that now in this shell, I go and I run, for example, a curl container. And here I start doing curlgoogle.com and everything works fine. Falco doesn't complain. Now, let's simulate that we are a malicious user. And you know that sometimes uh, uh, there are some root kits that, for example, they overwrite system binary with compromised one. So do not do this at home. But if I take user bin curl and I write it into bin ls, um, I created a mess. And you can see that Falco immediately tells me, hey, a file below an unknown binary directory has been renamed or removed. And it will tell me the user, the command that has been executed, as well as the file. User, uh, user bin curl has been written in bin ls. So Falco detects that this is not normal. And it doesn't end here, because now ls is really curl. So if I now do ls google.com, you can see that Falco starts screaming and say, hey, what, what did you just do? Uh, unknown system binary sent and received network traffic. And it tells me ls, and it tells me all the individual, you know, network stream, so we can see the DNS traffic, then we can see a bunch of traffic towards a few uh, IPv4 and IPv6 endpoint on port 80. And Falco has a database of what is good and what is bad. And in this case, Falco knew that the core utils should not generate outgoing network activity, right? And uh, uh, the core intelligence of Falco is in the rule database that is a YAML file where you can specify rules, and rules can contain metadata as well as priority and things like that, but the key part is this one. The condition is specified as a filter with the same language that you would use for sysdig for the troubleshooting. So you can, with one single language, you can seamlessly go from the world of troubleshooting and observability for troubleshooting purposes to a world of observability for forensic purposes. And we think this is very powerful, because again, you can take this thing and uh, use it with sysdig, and it will work just, just as well. So these rules are very powerful. Uh, Falco ships uh, uh, tons of them by default. We have uh, actually uh, a few advanced users who completely redefine their own for very large infrastructure. So we know this works quite well also at scale. And you can see a few examples. For example, things that you might want to get uh, alerted on, and bad behavior could be you know, a shell that is running a container, uh, or your Elasticsearch container is doing outgoing network activity on a weird port, or the one that we just saw, right? A file has been written under the system binaries directory. Or even more advanced, you can, for example, just by looking at the system calls, you can see whenever someone has tried to execute something inside a container. And you can detect this uh, with, you know, with the set and system call that allows you to cross the namespace boundaries. So overall, Falco is really cool. And now we have three blocks. Now we have observability way to identify services, and way to alert on bad behavior. So the fourth thing that we then did, essentially, for our runtime container security, and, this, and everything that I just showed is completely open source. So the fourth thing that um, we can do is essentially make it scale. So how we combine all these building blocks, and we do a kick-ass product that actually works well with you know, thousands of hosts, hundreds of thousands of containers, and it can protect everything. And so last week, we announced uh, uh, our newest product, Sysdig Secure. Sysdig Secure is a distributed runtime container security plus forensics. I highlight again the forensics because as you'll see, forensics is really, really cool with this thing. So I want to walk you through it. And uh, once you open it, again, it's a web application. And you see that uh, um, the main part of the application is the policies. So with the policies, you can choose how you want to protect your infrastructure. And again, policies, 
you will see that they have uh, a name that is very similar to the ones that I just showed with Falco, right? In fact, there's a very tight integration between Falco rules and SysDig secure policies. And when you open one, you can see that you can specify, obviously, a bunch of metadata. Then you can specify the actual condition, and this will get inferred from the Falco rule, as we'll see in a second. And then you can specify the action. So action can go from uh, stop the container, pause the container, or as you'll see, and it's very cool, the ability to create a SysDig trace file. Uh, and then you get all sorts of, all sorts of notifications. So now I want to move to an actual live demo. So cross your fingers for me. And here I have, uh, in this Kubernetes infrastructure, I have a little, let's call it, you know, a little microservice, which is a vulnerable PHP application that is based on PHP Mailer. PHP Mailer is this very popular component, you know, to send uh, emails via web forms. And I installed a version from last year that contains a remote execution vulnerability. So if you send a crafted payload to this form, you are able to, uh, you know, trick uh, uh, PHP Mailer into executing custom PHP code, which is very bad. And it's, you know, it's very typical with what happens uh, these days with web applications. So the way I'm going to exploit it, I have over here a little exploit that I can use. And uh, if I run it, I run it against the IP address of the service. If I run it, this will actually inject a backdoor inside uh, the service, and you will use this backdoor as a trampoline, as a trampoline to uh, do some denial of service attack towards a third party. So once I run this script, I can then go back to secure in the event section, and in the event section, you can see uh, that I can navigate my infrastructure from the point of view of services. The event section is what you use to keep an eye into what happened in your infrastructure. And for example, here you can see, notice how I don't have the security by container or by host. I have the security by service. So in this case, I have the production in space. And you can see that I have a bunch of applications inside the production in space. And one of these is Apache. And Apache has five event notifications. And I can explore them over here. And it will tell me that at 12.06, so exactly one minute ago, uh, two policies were triggered. A process outside the baseline was spawned and a write below www was done. These policies are two policies that I defined over here. And uh, I defined these two policies, for example, write below www. And uh, this is a custom policy where you can see has a scope, so as a target for what gets protected. I didn't specify any container or any host. I actually specified the coordinates, you know, in Kubernetes language, the coordinates of my service, which is what, as an application developer, I reason about, because I don't reason in terms of container name or container ID. And I could add all sorts of you know, slicing keys. And then, I, and then I used, as a condition, I used this right below www, which again, this is simply specified via a simple Falco rule that alerts me whenever there's a write activity under slash www. And then, as an action, I also get to create a sysdict trace file, which we'll see in a second. Then I also had another policy, which is a process executed outside the baseline. So since I know the workload of my service that well, I can actually uh, write a policy that will alert me whenever a process that is outside this baseline gets spawned, because it's probably means something malicious. And so if I go back to the events, I can explore what happened. And if I click on this, I see a full timeline of the security incident. And you can see that the first thing that triggers is right below www. And if I click on this, I see the whole details up to the individual container this time, because this time might be important. And then you see the details, and these are pushed automatically by Falco. And this tells me a file below www was open for writing. And the command that opened a file for writing was sendmail. Again, sendmail is the, you know, the popular application to send emails from the command line that probably PHP mailer uses. And it tells me also the file, slash www slash backdoor.php. So not a very comforting name. And then, immediately after, you see a bunch of uh, incidents, a bunch of events related to policies outside the baseline was spawned. And if I click on one, you can see that Falco tells me, hey, a process outside the baseline was spawned. And you can see that the command is curl with curl www.badguy.com. And uh, this is how you know, my attacker did the attack. Because first, it injected a backdoor in my PHP application. Then it used this probably to run some malicious curl towards a victim. And uh, 
Uh, I can explore more. So with this, I have a pretty cool timeline of what happened. But I can explore much more. And for example, I can go into commands. And this will tell me the commands in the infrastructure that have been executed. So this is useful for the forensics point of view. And again, here you can see that same mail was executed in a shell. And then uh, uh, you know, a bunch of curves were, were, um, were essentially started. And you can also look at everything that happened on your whole infrastructure. So you can see here a bunch of curves that my uh, client client deployments are doing to keep the infrastructure up and running. And so by navigating from the command history to the policy events, you can get a pretty good idea you know, of what happened uh, from a security point of view. Although we said we capture so much data with all these system calls that uh, this interface is very cool, but it's so limited because there's, you know, there's so much more that you can look at. And so we came up with this other feature over here, which is the trace file. So since we see all the system calls, SysD can actually create a trace file at the time of the attack and can send it over, you know, this, this, uh, and can send it over to the secure console where it can be analyzed. But not only that, something that we did was in our agent, now we keep a memory buffer. And in this memory buffer, we keep a rolling captures 24 seven of all the system calls. And if you tweak the size of this memory buffer, you can hold from a few seconds to a few minutes of history, you know, depending on the size and your workload. And if you do this, now when a policy event triggers, you can cut a slice from this buffer and you can see back in time, you can see with full granularity, all the events that led up to the security incident, which is really is the holy grail of forensic analysis, as you'll see in a second. And in fact, you can see over here that when I, when I clicked on create capture, I said not only take five seconds after the event, but also five seconds before the event. So now if I go in the events page, again, Hope for me that this will work because this was a live demo. Uh, you can see that there was an icon over here that tells me that for this policy event, a trace file was created. So now if I go to capture recorded, I get the capture recorded. You can see that it's 10 seconds and uh, it's, in, uh, it's in this specific deployment and container. And I can download this and this will download me the full SysDict trace file that I can then analyze with the command line tool, which again, once you get proficient with the command line tool, it's very, very cool. It's super effective. But something that we said is, okay, we should really provide more instant gratification to the user because using the command line, it's, it's super cool. I do it all the time. But you know, if you can use a nice, nicely crafted UI, it's even better. So we came up with another open source project that is called SysDig Inspect. SysDig Inspect is a UI around the open source SysDig tool. SysDig Inspect allows you to explore a SysDig trace file with a very intuitive yet super powerful UI. And uh, now we are going to use it to explore the trace file that led up to the event. So as you can see over here, as a default, you have uh, a bunch of tiles that show you a few information about the trace file. So this is good to get an overall idea of what happened. But where it starts getting very powerful is over here. Here you can see the trace file was 10 seconds. And you can see there was a SysDig secure notification. So if I click on this, I get a little, yeah, you can see here. Uh, you can see a little time series that tells me that exactly in the middle of the capture, a SysDig secure notification triggered. And if I click on the SysDig secure notification, it will tell me that it was a write below www. So this is also integrated with secure, but it's fully open source. So now I can start to uh, get more information as to what actually happened in the, you know, in the attack. And for example, I know that an attack should always start with some incoming network activity in my case, right? So I'm going to use the tile network activity and notice how immediately I can correlate a connection with the actual event. Then uh, SysDig Secure actually alerted me the processes were spawned outside the baseline. So let me click on the tile executed commands. And again, you can see a bunch of executed commands in the surrounding of the notification. And then there was one more, which was the other, uh, the, uh, the other one. The other one was the modified files, because uh, there was backdoor.php written. So if I click on modify files, now you see you know, all this activity. And look at how intuitive this is, because here I have the perfect timeline of an attack. A connection was executed. Uh, sorry, you know, an inbound connection was opened. Then a process was executed. Then a few files were modified, and then a SysDig secure notification was triggered. So you have a perfect timeline of the event, and this is not uh, with a higher granularity. This is a millisecond granularity, because again, there is no aggregation. You couldn't get more granular information than this. This is each and every single system call. So here is up to the millisecond. So now that we have an idea, 
we need to explore in this surrounding, right? So let's zoom in into this, because I want to see what's going on in this network connection. And you can see there was one network connection. And if I click on this, you can see the network connection on port 80. And uh, if I click on this little button, this will bring me to a view where I see each system call that was related to that connection. So this is super cool. Uh, but something that I care about, maybe I care a little bit more about the uh, actual payload that was uh, you know, sent over this connection. So if I move back and I go into the stream mode, you can get the same experience that I was getting in the command line, and I can get the full HTTP request, and you can see that someone posted, uh, uh, you know, did an HTTP post request with a bunch of crap as a payload, but if you notice carefully, there is this crafted PHP line that is, you know, this is native PHP code, and it calls the system function, very bad, you know, a system function is a function that you use to execute another program, and uh, the system function will take as an argument a base64 encoded command parameter from the get, uh, you know, from the get parameter. So if the attacker is able to inject this into a file, then we are going to be in trouble. So uh, we saw that right after this network connection, a process was executed, right? So let's go back and let's look at the actual executed commands. And you can see the send mail. And again, this is very consistent with what Secure was telling me. So send mail with a weird argument and www slash backdoor.php. So let's go look into this file. And this is the part where it's very cool. Because the network connection, you could get them, you know, maybe with some TCP dump trick or something like that. But this one, if you go to modified files, you can actually see which files were read or written in this interval. And you can see that backdoor.php was written for 688 bytes. And since we see things at the system call, there is really no difference between a network payload and a file I.O. payload. So if you click on stream, you get to the actual content of the file that was written. Even if this container was long gone and it doesn't exist anymore, this was immediately shipped you know, to your, uh, you know, to your SysDig Secure backend, and here you can see the content of the file. And you can see that somehow the PHP line of code, the very bad one that executes, uh, uh, you know, that allows essentially remote execution, is written under www.backdoor.php. And this is absolutely bad, because now it means that everyone who does an HTTP request against backdoor.php on my server is able to execute random code. And in fact, my suspicion is it, it's exactly what happens in these later connections, right? So let me, let me reset the time navigation. And let's focus a little bit more to this other connection, you know, the second part of the attack. In this second part of the attack, I can see that there are a bunch of connections. And if I click on connections, uh, this will essentially show me, show me them. And uh, let's pick, for example, this one that comes from this IP address that I know is the one that I used for the attack. And if I look at what was transferred in this one, you can see that it's an HTTP get request that asks for backdoor.php. And as a command, it passes this random blob. And uh, in this blob, I already know that it's a base64 encoded thing. Like, so I can just copy it. And for example, I can go online on a base64 decoder. And uh, it shows up as curl www.badguy.com. And uh, in fact, something that I can do right after, if I go back to inspect, is while I'm focusing in this time interval, I can actually go to executed commands. And this will show me all, uh, you know, all the curl commands, which is exactly what Secure was showing me. So um, this is a workflow that we like a lot, again, for having the ability to do full granularity back in time um, forensic analysis at the system call level. It's really amazing. And uh, again, I hope that with this, uh, you know, you are able to see the value and the importance also of being able to have uh, a recording of everything that's happened in your very, very dynamic infrastructure so that when things go wrong, you can use the same workflow for troubleshooting and for security protection. Um, this is uh, pretty much all I had. Um, if you're interested a little bit more, uh, a whole lot of the tools that I just showed are open source. So if you go on sysdig.org, you can actually grab the open source sysdig command line tool with the full you know, kernel and system call based instrumentation. You can grab a Falco, and then you can grab Inspect. So sysdig Inspect is this UI for sysdig that I just showed, and is again fully open source. And if you want to try sysdig secure, you can sign up for a free trial there, and you can also stop uh, by our booth. 
And uh, this is all I had. Uh, I left uh, uh, a couple minutes uh, to see if there's any question, anything uh, uh, interesting that you would like to ask from the technical point of view or not. Um, there's a question. So that is a very good point. Uh, and again, if you haven't heard of it, the, the, the question was, uh, does the fact that Falco rules uh, must be created manually create some friction? What happens in practice is that there is a little bit of friction. Uh, with Falco rules, we have noticed that there are two types of users. There are the users who uh, just want to use it essentially off the shelf, and they use the standard rule set that we constantly maintain, like every week we add new stuff and we change new stuff, uh, and uh, that stuff covers you quite a lot. You can think of it as using Snort with the default rule set, something like that. And so, and the false positives uh, are very, very low essentially, so there's not a very, there's not a very big error rate. Then there's the other side of the, um, essentially of the spectrum, which are users that instead started with a rule set from scratch and they completely defined their own and I've seen the stuff that they have done, it was quite amazing. But to answer your question, yes, there is a little bit of friction and the way we uh, are currently essentially experimenting both in the open source and in the SysDig secure world is uh, automatic rules generation, you know, so do baselining because again, as I was said, the containers have a very predictable workload. So if you're able to identify what runs in these services, what files are accessed, what system calls, what programs, what network activity, you can create automatic rule set and, and so you have, uh, uh, you know, you can give still full flexibility to the users because it's a super uh, useful and flexible filtering language, but you can also automate a bunch of stuff. And this will come, you are actively working on this stuff, both in the open source and, you know, in the commercial world, so expect more in the upcoming month. There's another question right there. Yeah. Yeah, so S-Trace and SysDig work completely different. S-Trace works with the P-Trace system call. So every time you want to look at a system call, you incur in actually in a process context switch because, you know, the, the, the kernel executes the system call for the process that you're instrumenting. The system call sees it is P-Trace, so there is a process context switch to your instrumenter. So your instrumenter really becomes a bottleneck and you have a bunch of, you know, cache trashing and all that because of these context switches. So that's why we address this in SysDig with essentially a high performance uh, Linux kernel module that works by capturing every system call uh, in line and shares this in a Linux kernel, uh, sorry, in a circular buffer that is shared between user space and memory space. So it's completely lockless. And most important, the application is never stopped. You know, the application doesn't wait. If when the application generates a system call, there's no more space in the ring buffer, the application just keeps going and the event will get dropped. So this is absolutely low, low, low overhead. Like this has been designed to run 24 seven in production. And we have, we have a lot of users, both from the open source point of view, as well as the commercial side, they use it 24 seven and the overhead is completely negligible. Um, yeah, we, we have put, I would say, we have put the largest amount of our efforts has been to making very uh, small overhead instrumentation. Because then again, otherwise it leads to friction. And again, then people don't use it and, and you know, then it didn't matter. There is one question right there. Yeah, so uh, if you use the actual secure, in secure you have all this integration already laid out, so whenever a Falco policy and a SysDig secure policy trigger, you can have, you know, Slack notification, email, pager duty, SNS, webhook, all, the, all that. That being said, in Falco, you can actually specify the, the, uh, the action that can be taken when a Falco rule triggers. So you can write your own, you can write your own, uh, your own bash script that emits, you know, I, I think by default we have like, uh, type a command, or execute, uh, uh, you know, or log, log to syslog. But if you have your little pass, uh, bash script, you know, that pushes, pushes to pager duty, yeah, yeah, then you're done. In fact, we know a lot of people who actually have done this sort of custom integration. I know of people who push all these events into Elasticsearch, you know, so then they get, um, 
you know, they're, they're trying to build something similar, similar to secure using 100% uh, open source components, which has its advantages. And I know it works well for them. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't think there are any more questions, right? Oh, no, there's one more. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 makes sense. So what happens is that the events for the back in time thing, they are never stored 24 seven, they are kept in memory. So in user space, you allocate, for example, 500 megabyte for the SysDig application, and these events will constantly be written in memory. So until you take captures, there's really no overhead because you know, it's, just, it's just a bunch of mem copies. So it's super, you know, it's super efficient. If you have gigabit traffic, you're not going to generate a gigabit stream of system calls also because we also have configurable SNAP plan. So exactly with TCP dump, you know, you might just, you know, you might just require to look at the actual HTTP request and the HTTP header. So you might not need a full payload. So if you specify a SNAP plan small enough, for example, 80 bytes, you can still get 90% of the value with, you know, one tenth of the, of, of, of the thing. When you actually, <coughs> when you actually, uh, dump the trace file on this, so you cut the slice and you send it over, there is where you can, you, know, you can have a big file, so you, I know you can go from a few megabytes to probably a few dozen megabytes for something like that per second, could be reasonable. There you store it wherever you want. So, you know, if you, if you roll out your own integration, you, do, you store it wherever you want. If you use, if you use SysDig Secure, we provide essentially a custom S3 bucket storage for you, uh, or you can also store it essentially in uh, Cassandra if you, if you use the version that is behind the firewall. So we, has, we, have, we have a Cassandra cluster that we use to ingest uh, all, all this metric. And so, you know, for convenience, we use, we use also Cassandra as an object storage for these sorts of things. Um, and I think the time is yep. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>